Good afternoon. Welcome to CAF special program in our series, Palestinian Intransigence and Antisemitism. Today, we're pleased to have two very special guests, Hugh Kitson, who is joining us from London, and Morty Kadar, who's joining us from Israel. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of CAF. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Anita Bromberg, President of the Canadian Antisemitism Education Foundation, to say a few words. Anita? We welcome uh, everyone for attending, and I see people are uh, coming in, and um, we know you're going to have a very interesting uh, webinar, and thank you, Andrea, for all you do to, to bring such interesting speakers. Uh, CAEF. Uh, is a registered charitable organization that I'm proud to be part of. Um, we ask that this time that you take a moment and consider making a donation um, online, caef.ca. Uh, your support enables us to develop educational resources, host webinars, manage two websites, arrange events such as our very recent Stronger Together to End Jew Hatred Seminar, research and prepare advocacy briefs and letters, produce a weekly bulletin, contribute to a documentary film about uh, terrorist training in Israel and the disputed territories, conduct research into university-based, um, sorry, university-based um, activity and anti-Semitism. Well, there's a whole host of activity, and your support would enable us to continue this work. Um, all of us are volunteers, but we can't do it without your help. All gifts are tax deductible. Donations uh, can be made, as I said, online at caef.ca. And if you're in Canada, the, they will be directed to CAEF, and you will get a charitable donation. If you're in the United States, uh, they will be directed uh, through the Lawfare Project, which partners with us. And they will see that the donations are forwarded to us. And through them, you will also get a, a letter for tax purposes. Again, I thank you for your support. And I thank Andrea for all she does to bring these conversations. And of course, thank you to our speakers today. Thank you, Anita. As mentioned, CAF works collaboratively with many NGOs, and today we'd like to thank the following NGOs for their sponsorship of this program. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, Canada, Chirut, Canada, the Matatias Project, Israel Committee of Sonoma County, North Carolina Coalition for Israel, the J.CA, the Lawfare Project, Israel Action Committee of East Bay, Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Adith Israel Congregation, the Ludger Center Congregation, Club Z, Atlantic Israel Coalition, the Israel Activist Calendar, and Jew, Hate Can and Jew Hatred Canada, and Titled Deed Media. Our partners and sponsors are Zionist-aligned organizations standing together to counter the lies and bigotry of anti-Zionism, which is anti-Semitism and to build Jewish pride and allyship. Today, I'm especially pleased to introduce Hugh Kitson, one such great Christian ally. Hugh is one of the founders of Title Deed Media and producer and director of Whose Land. With 50 years experience as a writer, director, and producer, Hugh's work has become focused on getting out the truth about Israel. And in a few minutes, Hugh will introduce his latest film. It's also a great pleasure to introduce a friend to many of you, as well as to CAEF. Few academics can match Dr. Kadar's breadth of knowledge of the Arab world, Israel, and Middle East relations. Dr. Kadar is fluent in Hebrew, English, and Arabic, and is often interviewed on Arab television and regularly solicited for explanations on Arabic thinking and approaches to issues, and on what the Arab street is saying about Jews, Judaism, and Israel. He has a significant knowledge of Arab mass media, popular culture, and gender issues in Islam. Mordechai Kadar is an assistant professor at Bar Ilan University and is an adjunct lecturer at Tel Aviv University and Ariel College, as well as being a member of three research groups in Israel. He is a research associate for the Began to Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, director of the Center for the Study of Middle East and Islam at Bar Ilan University, and a member of the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center. He served as 
in the IDF and was a branch head in military intelligence, retiring as a lieutenant colonel after many years of active duty. He's also a founding member of Abithanistim, Israel's Defense and Security Forum. I will mention here that though he's not in person, the narrator of Whose Land features another great ally. The series is greatly enhanced by the narration by Colonel Richard Kemp, who had a long and distinguished military career in the British Army and has since spoken out on a range of social and political issues. He's a staunch defender of the IDF, which he's often stated is the most moral army in the world. I would re uh, remind people that if you're using the chat, please be respectful. If you have a question, please use the Q&A and we'll try to get to your questions at the end. Now we're going to talk about the Oslo Accord, which to many has seen the rise in terrorism. Not It has not been followed by peace. Hugh, would you like to introduce the uh, film? Yes, uh, good afternoon to everyone in America, Canada, and if you're on this side of the Atlantic and in Israel, good evening. Um, Whose Land is a documentary series that uh, is looking at the legitimacy of Israel in international law. We released the first part of it um, back in 2017 in time for the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. And for a number of reasons, the uh, production of part two got delayed, but we're well into it now. And basically, uh, part two, which begins with the War of Independence, looks at the legitimacy of Israel, in, in particular, uh, Israel's right to domicile in Judea, Samaria, and especially Jerusalem in international law. Now we hear an awful lot about um, Israel occupying Palestinian territory. And in one of the future um, episodes to come, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, our illustrious on-camera presenter and narrator, he poses a question. And the question is, um, is the term occupied Palestinian territory justified in international law, or is it just anti-Israel propaganda? Well, um, our team of lawyers uh, give us a very clear and uh, unambiguous answer to that question. And I think it's the answer that many of you would want to hear. Um, but the whole purpose of, of Whose Land is to try to, um, really portray the truth in the face of an all, awful lot of lies. Now, um, this episode on, on the Oslo Accords, which we actually only released a week ago on the 30th anniversary, um, is in the middle of the part two um, episodes. It's, uh, it's the fifth one out of nine. And um, after, after we've had a look at the film, I will uh, I will put our YouTube channel in the chat so that you can watch all 15 episodes that we've done so far. There'll be 19 by the time we finish part two and number 16, actually, uh, which looks number 16 is quite a technical one because it looks at the 2004 opinion of the International Court of Justice. Uh, that basically denounced Israel's security barrier to protect a civilian population. And our team of lawyers actually do, in my opinion, a wonderful job in just pulling the whole thing apart because the case is not only deeply flawed, um, but it was just based on facts. Well, not facts. It was based on myth, really. Um, so that'll be the next one. But this one looks specifically at the Oslo Accords. And at the time, 30 years ago, when it was announced on the White House lawn, everyone thought, well, peace has come at last. Well, it's it's done no such thing. And uh, our very good friend, Dr. Mordecai Kedar, uh, will say he, he will give us some very good reasons why. 
afterwards. So thanks very much and maybe we'll have a look at the film. Suddenly, in September 1993, the world's media were proclaiming a new era of peace in the Middle East. In a historic and controversial move, Israel recognized the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, which had committed numerous terrorist atrocities as the official representative of the Palestinian Arabs. A declaration of principles for the negotiations for a peace accord was agreed upon. What we are doing today is more than signing an agreement. It is a revolution. Yesterday, a dream. Today, a commitment. The Israeli and the Palestinian peoples. Some three decades after the initial signing of what became known as the Oslo Accords and its historic handshake between sworn enemies, the dream remains a dream, the commitment never realised. Indeed, there is not even agreement on what was contained in that signed commitment back in 1993. Excluded from the original Declaration of Principles at that time, by mutual agreement between both parties, was any discussion about a Palestinian state or the status of East Jerusalem. The autonomy is in Gaza and Jericho, not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem uh, after, after the Jericho and Gaza. Yet before the ink had dried on the agreement, the PLO was already claiming that Jerusalem, and particularly the old city, with its holy places and shrines, would be the capital of a future state of Palestine. Jerusalem for uh, the capital of Palestine. The Oslo agreements don't say anything about the status of Jerusalem. They say this is a matter which is going to be negotiated. So I don't believe that the Oslo agreements in any way wave or contravene or undermine or change the status of Jerusalem prior to 1993. Interestingly, the Oslo agreement does not talk about Palestinian statehood. It doesn't say that a Palestinian state will be created. It simply says that Israel agrees to enter into a process to resolve the conflict. There has never been any legal commitment, legal document, treaty, agreement, contract, or formal binding resolution that's determined that the territories belong to the Palestinians or that they're under Palestinian sovereignty, or that they're Palestinian. A number of issues were explicitly reserved for final status agreement, and those included the status of Jerusalem, it included the status of the settlements, um, and these were all matters that Israel and the PLO agreed to negotiate. But it never says that all of the West Bank will ultimately belong to the Palestinians. That was a matter for negotiation. Today, some three decades on from the original signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, its provisions have been conveniently forgotten by the Palestinian Arabs. In 1995, Israel and the PLO signed a further interim agreement that became known as Oslo II, which gave the Palestinian Arabs autonomous government in parts of Judea and Samaria, which includes Bethlehem behind me. In the Oslo Accords, the Israelis and Palestinians agreed that to divide the areas pending a final status, a permanent status agreement, to divide the areas into three areas A and B, which are the main uh, Palestinian towns and villages, which will be transferred by Israel to the Palestinian Authority, which was set up in order to administer these areas, and area C, which is an area that, that's sparsely populated, but it, it contains Israel's military installations and settlements, and this would remain under the jurisdiction and control of Israel. The Palestinians agreed to this. In, in legal terms, it's called lex specialis. In other words, it's a special legal regime that overcomes all other legal regimes. So it, 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 it's 
prior to the Geneva Convention or anything else because it's agreed upon between the Israelis and the Palestinians that areas A and B, they will uh, uh, rule those areas and they will legislate and they have their court and their parliament and whatever. And in area C, Israel will continue to administer this area from all points of view until uh, there's a, a permanent status. And it says specifically in the, in the Oslo Accords that each side has the freedom to do planning, zoning and construction in the areas under its control. Which basically means that the Palestinians can build what they want in their areas and Israel can build whatever it wants in its areas. And there's no limitation in the Oslo Accords on settlement activity or building or anything like that. So yes, um, I grew up in Israel in what is called the Israeli left, the Labour Party. Uh, I grew up very much believing that uh, the conflict was about Palestinian statehood, drawing borders, settlements, and very much believed that the day that the Palestinians would have a chance to have a state of their own in the West Bank and Gaza is the day we would have peace. The Oslo Accords were very divisive within Israel, both within society itself and politically. Most people on the so-called right wing of the political divide were ideologically opposed to the idea of land for peace, believing that ceding any of Israel's historic heartland to the PLO would be like allowing a Trojan horse into their midst. That has certainly proved to be the case. However, the majority of people on the left, like Dr. Anat Wilf, believed, as she does to this day, that the way ahead is to show good faith to the people known as the Palestinians in order to bring peace. This is exactly what Israel embarked on with the Oslo Accords. In my view personally, even though Israel has a claim and legitimate claim to the land, it should, as an act of goodwill, make it clear that it's renouncing its claim for most of it in order to demonstrate the notion that peace will be achieved when both sides recognize that they cannot have it all. In the year 2000, US President Bill Clinton met with Yasser Arafat and the then Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak at Camp David in Maryland. The aim? to bring about a negotiated final status agreement under Oslo. Dr. Einat Wilf was an advisor to the then Foreign Minister Shimon Peres at the time of the Oslo negotiations in the early 1990s. Uh, the 90s in that respect were a time of euphoria for me. I felt that we were finally putting that idea, we we're implementing it, and that peace was just around the corner. Um, I remember the handshakes on the manicured lawns, the soaring speeches. There was really a sense that this was all finally happening. And then uh, in 2000, in many ways, it all came crashing down. And the years since then have been ones of devastation. Uh, not just for me, for the Israeli left in general. In 2000 at Camp David, they're talking peace. And everyone thought at that moment, peace had run the corner. In fact, Arafat was already planning the second intifada. As soon as he got back home, he had to walk out. Simply walked out. He had gone there as a man of peace. He actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for doing it. He won a peace prize for going home and starting a war. In 2000, Yasser Arafat rejected the best deal that he could have possibly got. One has to ask the question, why? Could it be that he would have to abandon the Palestinian National Charter that calls for the destruction of the Jewish state? Was it that he wanted to disinherit the Jewish people of their historic and cultural capital, which was recognized as such in international law, without having to make any concessions whatsoever? Was his ultimate aim to rip the heart and soul out of the Jewish people through the international community compelling them to surrender their ancient capital, which is so central to their cultural, religious, and spiritual identity. They know that Jerusalem is a weak link in the chain because they know that Jerusalem is actually the center of the Jewish people. And without Jerusalem, there will be no Israel because without Zion, 
There is no Zionism. And they know it very well. Unfortunately, too many countries in the world still do not recognize Jerusalem to be part of Israel because they still stick to the partition plan of 1947, which mentions that Jerusalem should be under international government. The Palestinians tell the world in English that Israel exists and they recognize its existence, but they will never recognize Israel's right to exist. From the beginning, and I think until this very day, the main goal of the PLO on the international arena is to undermine the status of Israel as a state among the states in the world, to undermine the recognition which states gave to Israel as a state with the right to exist. Amongst themselves, they say that they don't recognize Israel on any borders. For external consumption in English, uh, they will claim that they recognize Israel, but they will insist that they won't recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Everything which they can do in order to weaken Israel and to bring it to its, to its knees. Everything is okay. And this is actually the derivatives of the uh, charter of the PLO. Moreover, the PLO undertook in the Oslo Accords to renounce terrorism and to amend their founding charter that calls for the liquidation of the State of Israel through armed struggle. Not only does the aim of the destruction of Israel remain the central platform of their charter, but as Israel conceded land for peace through negotiation, Palestinian terrorism actually increased in response. To have people being blown up of families, children, in cafes, in buses, and it's in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Be'er Sheva, not, uh, not in the West Bank, not in Gaza. Supposedly nothing controversial about these areas, but this is where families were being targeted and were being killed. In the next episode of Whose Land, we examine the 2004 opinion of the International Court of Justice in response to the construction of Israel's security barrier to prevent the large-scale murder of its citizens by Palestinian terrorists. Thank you. I'm now going to invite Dr. Kadar to talk about the betrayal by Palestinian Arabs in regards to the Oslo Accords. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea, for arranging this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, you, for this magnificent uh, a, a, a film which you produced and I thank each and everyone who takes part in this uh, webinar. I would like to dedicate uh, my part in this webinar to the memory of Eli Hertz, an, an Israeli guy who lived in Queens near New York and he actually was the one who initiated the project of uh, a myth and facts, uh, which he, he had the, the the idea to create it. He passed away uh, not long ago, and uh, may he rest in peace. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Oslo agreements uh, were signed in 1993 when I was in the army. I was in the intelligence, and already then, uh, since the beginning, there were all kinds of uh, of signs uh, that these agreements are walking in the wrong path. Um, especially what Arafat was talking about, the Hudaybiyah peace. Hudaybiyah peace is a peace which the Prophet Muhammad gave to the infidels of Mecca uh, in the year of 628 a temporary peace because he was weak and he could not defeat them. He, he gave them a peace for almost 10 years. So they went on business. And after two years, when he, he said that they actually went to business and fell asleep on God, he raided uh, 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 Mecca, killed all the infidels. And uh, this was the end of the temporary peace after two years of 10. And, uh, and, and Muslims until this very day, understand that if you are weak, means the Muslim is weak, you can give the infidel a temporary peace. Let him fall asleep 
and when he is snoring, you can uh, uh, raid him and cancel the peace even within the time of the temporary peace. And this is allowed. And, and, and Arafat was talking about this when he was speaking to Arabs or Muslims to justify the Oslo agreements. And here in Israel, we had it. But the political leadership of those days, and I specifically talk about Perez, Shimon Perez, and, and Yossi Bailin, and Alon Liel, and, uh, and, and others who fell in love with Arafat, no less, uh, always told us that Arafat is saying all these things only for domestic consumption. And uh, really, he means peace because he became a, a peace dove. And uh, th this actually was maybe a self-deception, uh, which uh, uh, has to be uh, uh, investigated how these people were uh, pulled by their nose uh, in, in such a shameful way and to shape uh, the Israeli security and the, and the future on dreams about New Middle East. And I, 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 I highly recommend to read Shimon Peres' book, uh, The New Middle East, in order to see how remote the man was from the reality of the Middle East. Uh, really, he couldn't, he couldn't reconcile between what he thought and the reality in the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, these accords uh, were signed in 1993 because of something very dreadful which happened in 1992, a year earlier. In that year, which was uh, the first after uh, the, the, the first year of the second term of, uh, of Yitzhak Rabin as a prime minister, three Israeli soldiers were kidnapped and killed by Hamas and the Jihad and the Islamic Jihad. The names is the names are Nisim Toledano, the other one is Avis Asportas, and the third is Ilan Saadon. They were kidnapped and killed by Hamas and the Jihad, and the whole country was screaming and shouting about this. The media didn't leave this issue for one minute, and. Uh, uh, we are very worried that uh, everyone now is could be targeted by the, the the Islamic Jihad and the Hamas, and don't forget that we were already after the beginning of the Madrid process, which began in the in the uh, towards the end of 1991, when President Bush, the father, uh, wanted to shape the new Middle East after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, there were all kinds of committees about peace between Israel and Syria, uh, peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and, and, and co commercial peace and whatever. And um, in this process, uh, apparently it didn't lead to nowhere. And these three Israelis were kidnapped and killed. This actually uh, uh, led the Israeli government in, the, in December of 1992 to take 415 leaders of the Hamas and the Jihad and to expel them to Lebanon because they were inciting uh, to violence against the Israelis. There were those who were at least ideologically behind the Hamas and behind the Jihad. And it was December, it was a winter, uh, to a place named Marja Zuhur in Lebanon, which was covered with snow. And Israel just brought them to that place as some kind of a punishment to the jihad and Hamas, and uh, Israel um, assumed, or the Israeli government assumed, that the Lebanese will take them from the snow, and they will host them in normal places, and this way uh, Israel will get rid of these uh, leaders and inciters. However, uh, again, when you don't understand the Middle East, you make such mistakes. The Lebanese, although they were Arabs, many of them are Muslims, left the leaders of the Hamas and the Jihad, the 415 people, out in the snow for weeks. Just imagine. And the whole world media came, the CNN, and you know, everybody was, you know, angry about Israel. What is this? Well, the behavior to, to send all these poor people uh, to, to the snow. What kind of behavior? What is this? And... Um, a, a group here of uh, an, an NGO named Bezalem, which is uh, ultra leftist, 
um, human rights organizations which cares only for the rights of Arabs here in Israel, uh, even terrorists, appealed to Bagats, to the Supreme Court, um, claiming that there is no such a punishment uh, which is to send the snow. And anyway, these people did not have any trial against them, only because they are leaders does, doesn't mean that they have to be expelled to Lebanon or to the Lebanese snow. So the government was forced uh, to bring those people back home uh, and this caused the government very, I would say, de deep shame uh, that this plan to expel these people who are definitely behind uh, Hamas and the Jihad, uh, it, it didn't work and the government had to admit that this was a failure or a failing uh, step against them. Less than a year later, when the Oslo agreements were, or the Oslo process was revealed, and uh, they were towards to, uh, towards uh, signing it, and there was a big opposition in Israel, the government kept telling us that Arafa, whom we are bringing to rule or to run the PA, will deal with the Hamas and the Jihad without Bagats and without B'Tselem means without the Supreme Court and without the uh, human rights organizations. And this, this saying was actually referring to the failure of the government to expel those 415 people because of the Supreme Court and the human rights organizations. Means we, will, we, ass we assume that Arafat became um, you know, a Zionist and he will fight the Hamas and the Jihad uh, without restrictions which we are bound by, means the Supreme Court and human rights organizations. And this assumption was totally, absolutely, completely baseless because Arafat never said that he will really fight Hamas and the Jihad. But this was how it was sold to us Israelis as uh, the reason why we should go to this process. The process actually was based on five pre-assumptions. One is the PLO, as I mentioned, uh, gave up on eradicating Israel, and the PLO became a peace organization which accepts Israel as a Jewish state and will fight the terrorism uh, as, uh, as, uh, as they told us. This one pre-assumption, which was totally wrong. The second is that the end game from the Palestinian side will be a Palestinian state at some point in future. And this Palestinian state will live peacefully side by side near Israel, will accept Israel as a Jewish state and will uh, live peacefully with this. Again, this pre-assumption was totally Wrong. Third uh, assumption was that the Oslo agreements will bring about the recognition of Arab of other Arab countries which have not yet uh, signed peace with Israel, uh, and not not only this, also the Islamic countries, means from all the way from Indonesia um, in the east, all the way to Morocco uh, in the west because the Palestinian problem is solved and everybody now has no reason to stay hostile uh, 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 to Israel and they will all stand in line to sign agreements uh, with Israel and all Israel will have to do is to tell them don't push and we'll sign with everybody. This was the assumption which was also uh, uh, rather wrong. Another assumption is that once this struggle is solved, anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist, and maybe anti-Jewish sentiments, which uh, we can feel in many places in the world, will actually diminish because there is no reason to hate Jews and Israelis or Zionists anymore because the Israeli-Palestinian problem is solved. Again, this is a pre-assumption which was totally false because the causes for hatred to Jews 
are totally, uh, or <laughs> in most cases, <laughs> at least until recently, were never connected to the Palestinian issue. Uh, okay, we we suffer from anti-Semitism of anti-Jewish sentiment for what two millennia. Uh, so definitely this was wrong. But people talked about this in that year, in the end of '93, that anti-Semitism will be much uh, less uh, compared to what we see today. The fifth uh, pre-assumption was uh, actually Rabin believed in this that at any point if we realize that this process leads to uh, results which we didn't mean, we can uh, reverse it. We can cancel everything. We can um, get rid of Arafat, get rid of the PLO, get rid of the PA, get rid of the, everything which was uh, agreed, and the world will understand it because the world actually wants the same thing as we, we do. And this also was a, a pre-assumption which was totally baseless because as we saw already in the in the first five years between 94 between the the time which the pa was established and 99 the end of the five years of the oslo agreements uh, we saw that many european countries and also americans as individuals organizations are investing big big money in the pa and it was only logic to, to, to understand that these people will never allow any cancellation of this uh, project, which they uh, established, uh, most probably as because they understood the, re the reality about this. And this actually could be a very good Trojan horse in order to uh, harm Israel by establishing a terror state in the heartland of, uh, of the land, which uh, 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 very rightly, uh, Hans-Peter Buki here, um, who, who is attending this webinar now, uh, uh, mentioned that the whole country between the Jordan River and the sea uh, belongs to the Jewish people. Uh, as of uh, the early 20s, since the League of Nations decided these things, and of course, Goldie Steiner and others who uh, pushed this idea uh, day and night, uh, and a big blessing to, the, to them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually uh, what led the Israeli left to sign these agreements and to stand behind them. And the, 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 they, they believe in this so much that even when in 1995, 1996, uh, we, we suffered from many terror attacks by Hamas, by the Jihad, uh, who were uh, uh, implicitly and secretly encouraged by Arafat, uh, even paid for by Arafat, uh, uh, we, means the Israeli government, named the victims, the victims of peace. And this is a dreadful expression because since when Peace has victims. Peace is something which is meant to prevent victims, to en enable everyone to enjoy life because there is peace, no war anymore. So the expression victims of peace is something which, you know, mind boggling, especially when you see today that the whole thing was a fraud uh, by Arafat. And um, many of the expressions which we heard through the years actually um, uh, uh, make sure that the whole thing was a fraud. Arafat understood that the end of this peace uh, reached in May 2000. May 2000, like um, eight months or nine months after the end of the five years of the Oslo agreements. When we, Israel, withdrew from Lebanon under the leadership of Ehud Barak, the most failing uh, prime minister in Israel, uh, we ran away actually from Lebanon, uh, leaving for two long days our friends and allies uh, in Lebanon until we agreed to give them asylum inside Israel, a time which Hezbollah 
could slaughter them all, and thank goodness they didn't, but they could be slaughtered. And uh, when Arafat understood that we are running away from places which we have to fight in order to hold them, he assumed that now is the time to cancel the temporary peace, the Hudaybiyah peace, and he started towards the end of September in uh, 2000, he started the Second Intifada, uh, which he actually incited. He pushed people to carry out uh, suicide attacks in Israel. And uh, if we count the casualties since 1993, because of the Palestinian terrorism, we reached almost 2,000 people. 2,000 Israelis were killed because of this mistake strategic mistake and, uh, and unfortunately even right-wingish governments like Netanyahu uh, governments through the years did not succeed to cancel this uh, these agreements and they were forced mainly by the White House but not only to continue to give all kinds of things to the Palestinians in order to establish a Palestinian state not only this, in 2006, when the George W. Bush II, George W. Bush was the president, and Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State, in January 2006, there were elections, general elections, to the Legislative Council in the PA. Um, Bush and Condoleezza Rice, based on um, a Palestinian pollster, the brother of Fatih Shkaki, the, the one who founded the Islamic Jihad, and this, uh, the, the brother who is today alive in Ramallah, he has a, a company which uh, carries out polls. And he came out with the assumption or the results of a poll which showed in 2006 that Hamas will win uh, like 40% of the seats of the Palestinian Legislative Council. So, uh, if only 40% means not the majority, so Bush and Condoleezza Rice maintain a heavy pressure on uh, Ariel Sharon, who was then the Prime Minister, in order to allow uh, Hamas to run to the Palestinian Legislative Council, because anyway, they will be a minority. So, why not give them the opportunity to take part in democratic life uh, as we want to see a Palestinian state with a democratic life. So uh, they uh, actually forced him and, uh, uh, and Sharon um, agreed at the end of the day to allow Hamas to take part in the elections. Lo and behold, Hamas won 70% of the seats of the Legislative Council. And until this very day, Hamas occupies 70% of the legislative council. Okay, so meanwhile, since uh, 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 Abu Mazen, uh, uh, you know, the president uh, of the PA, realized that the legislative council is, is being occupied by Hamas, he froze the activity of this council, and until this very day, it's frozen. And there were no elections anymore because he's afraid that Hamas will win time and again. So since Hamas saw that they cannot exercise their right to run the PA, after all, they won the elections, they took Gaza over uh, with weapons. And until this very, and this was, this happened in June, 2007. And uh, ever since then, we have, instead of PLO and Arafat taking care of Hamas and the Jihad, what happened in Gaza is that Hamas and the Jihad are taking care of the PLO, means kick them out. Okay? And to that degree, the pre-assumption of the PLO, who will take care of Hamas and Jihad, was so mistaken to a degree that we have a, a Palestinian terror state led by Hamas with a Jihad in, in Gaza for more than 16 years already. It is, you know, it, it's so obvious, this uh, failure. But you know, people still talk about a Palestinian state, and this is the this is the something which really 
uh, I can do this, cannot understand. It already happened that Hamas took over either by election, by elections in January 2006 and by force in June 2007, Gaza. So if we have a Palestinian state, which only yesterday, President Biden said that he is still committed to this two-state solution. Can he, means by, can Biden, guarantee that the Palestinian state will never become an, uh, another Hamastan, either by elections, as already happened, or by coup d'etat, as already happened? Where is the logic? To establish a Palestinian state, it means that I would say inevitably it will turn into another Hamastan. So who in the right mind can support such a thing? And this is one of the outcomes of the Oslo agreements, which we cannot cancel them because the whole world, including the White House, is standing behind and trying to push it forward. And now with the Saudis as well in order to become a Palestinian state which will live peacefully with Israel and recognize its Israel uh, 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 right to exist. And here, uh, uh, let, let, let's have a little look at what the PA produces. And this is a scarf which they have, which they uh, distribute, you know, to, to demonstrators. Uh, this is the PLO flag. On one, on one side, they said Al-Quds Lana, Jerusalem is ours, since when Jerusalem is theirs. And on the other side is Palestine. Not Israel, Palestine. And it's the whole land from the river to the sea. So where is so, so where is Israel? If this is all Palestine, what in, in Canada or, or in Europe? Where so where is this? And this is what they show on right, left, and center. And this is the and they and they understand the connection. They saw they they claim Jerusalem is theirs because they know the connection between Jerusalem and the whole land. Because without Zion, uh, uh, there is no Zionism, as I mentioned in uh, Hughes' uh, film. And this is so clear. You don't need any interpretation. In all the uh, uh, school books, in textbooks, in maps, in, uh, in um, uh, drawings, whatever, you will never find any mention of Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, or as they call it, West Bank, and Gaza only. It always, always, 100% of the, of, the, of the times shows from the river to the sea. Because for them, Israel has no right to exist. They claim that they changed the the Palestinian uh, National Declaration, wrong. It's it's uh, totally false. And uh, a good friend of mine, Bill Langfan, may he rest in peace, actually proved it time and again. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely this was a big lie, which unfortunately too many Israelis fell in this trap. Um, we can you know speak about this uh, 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 march of nonsense uh, um, more and more, but I think that I would uh, open the stage for questions, remarks, answers, and I'll try to answer to answer these questions. Thank, thank you so much, Modi. That was fantastic and scary. So I have uh, several questions uh, from the audience, but let me start with a couple that might seem most obvious. Um, I'm actually surprised when you describe the um, the Israeli um, perception without calling them delusional. Was there not somebody at the top that was totally delusional in signing the accords and continuing to up, for Israel to uphold them seems delusional. Definitely. Uh, and, 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 and Paris was praised by the whole world for okay. his visions. You know, his visionary man. Okay. And everybody considers him to be the best um, uh, statesman in, in, the, in the time of his <laughs> Really, it you... even continued. It even continued after the first and second intifada, after there was plenty of proof on the ground and many people had been murdered. You still didn't have an Israeli leader coming out and saying the accords are a total failure. 
Is there a common sense now in Israel that they are a failure? Oh, the right, the right wing always, since the beginning, warned that this whole thing is a fraud, is a lie. And uh, and uh, well, they, were, they were depicted as peace deniers. But you say it cannot be canceled. Can it not be abrogated now? There's plenty of evidence that the PA has not lived up to any of it. So what is holding back the government now? Is it really pressure from the U.S. that they can't just say the accords don't exist, we're not maintaining them? I think that this, this is the biggest uh, obstacle. Right. The international uh, recruitment, I would say, for the PA. You know, somebody made a calculation that the PA got money more than the whole entire Europe after the Second World War in the Marshall Plan. You know, to reconstruct Europe and, and it, with real, real value, not a number of dollars, real value of money which was uh, sent to Europe in order to rebuild Europe after the great destruction of the Second World War was less money which was sent to the PA in order to establish a Palestinian state. Where is the money? And they are still living in refugee camps, many of them, even in so-called Palestine. So if they are in Palestine, how can they be refugees? Was okay. there someone else with whom Israel could have signed? Why did they choose Arafat, who was actually a foreigner? He was brought into the country to, and he was PLO, which was already a terrorist entity. Was there not a moderate? I don't even know if there's one today, but was there someone else with whom Israel could have negotiated or signed a deal? Definitely there were. Uh, especially the local leaders. Don't forget, mm -hmm. Arafat was born in Egypt. Yeah. And uh, Abu Mazen was not born also here, he was born in the Galilee. And in the Arab uh, uh, customs, you cannot bring a foreigner to control to control a place because the, the foreigners are always viewed as illegitimate rulers, which were brought either by the British or by the Americans or by the Israelis, or by all kinds of other, of other or French, uh, when it comes to Syria and Lebanon. So to bring somebody from abroad to run any place in the Arab world is totally illegitimate. And this is unfortunately what Britain did, France did, Italy did it in, in, uh, in, in, in Libya. And we did the same mistake here. But when you don't understand the culture of the Middle East, and, and unfortunately Israeli leaders in most cases do not have, are clueless about the culture of the Middle East. And they thought that since Arafat is the leader of the PLO, he will be viewed, he will be accepted as a, as a, 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 a legitimate leader. Uh, look, I have a friend, he, he was working in Ramallah um, as an advisor to the local authorities in Ramallah about all kinds, he's an Israeli friend. Uh, he, he, uh, he was like a liaison between the Ramallah municipality and all kinds of authorities in Israel, like the, the electric company, the water authority, all kinds of things. When they needed something from Israel, the, he was the liaison. Um, he spoke, speaks Arabic and he lived, he, he had the office in Ramallah. And when the agreements were signed with Arafat, all his uh, partners in, in Ramallah bursted into his office and shouted at him, how come you bring in this crook, Arafat? He will destroy our lives and your lives together. He, he discovered, he, of course, they didn't, he, he was not in charge of it. He was not to be blamed, but they didn't have any other Israeli to complain about this Israeli mistake by bringing Arafat from everybody. This liar, this uh, 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 terrorist, he will destroy your life and our life together. Okay, so many knew about him. Look, I always, uh, since at least 25 years, I try to push forward another solution, which is much more connected to the culture of the Middle East, which is the Emirate solution. The Emirate solution means that a, a government in Arab societies should be based on the local families. And families are, could be thousands of people because tribalism in the Middle East is alive and kicking. Unlike in Canada, unlike in the United States, unlike in Europe, here in the Middle East, the name of the social game is 
tribalism, whether we like it or not. Therefore, the Emirates in the Gulf are viable states because each and every one of these Emirates is one single or run by one single family. Kuwait is the family of Al Sabah. Qatar is Al Thani. Abu Dhabi, Al Nihyan. Dubai, Al Maktoum. Saudi Arabia, Al Saud. Okay, when you have a family, you, I know it's not dem democracy like in Western uh, concepts, but here in the Middle East, this is the only thing which works because, when you, because when you create a state with many families, many clans, many tribes, uh, many uh, ethnic groups like Arabs and Kurdish and others, many religions, Christians, Muslims, Yazidis, uh, uh, Sabais, Mandais, or many sects like Sunnah and Shia, as Iraqis, Syria, Lebanon, L uh, Yemen, um, uh, Libya, uh, Sudan. This is something which these countries are failing states because of, because the society is fragmented deeply and the, the groupings of people are so powerful that the state cannot create a nation out of this. There are, this, there are tribes, they remain loyal to the Shia, to the Sunnah, to the Islam, to Christianity, to all these traditional loyalties, and they don't mix with each other, they don't get married with each other, they don't, con they don't construct a nation. Yes, they are citizens of, let's say, Iraq or Syria, but they, it was, they ne never galvanized to be one nation. And this is the source of all failures in these countries. And this is why they, they are failing states. While the Emirates in the, in the Gulf and Saudi Arabia are successful states because they each and every one is one homogenous group. And when you base a state on one homogenous group, it is, it is flourishing with, with oil like Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia or without oil as it is in Dubai. Dubai has no oil. Okay. Why? In spite of the oil in Libya and Iraq, these two countries are failing states. Be not because of the oil, <laughs> because of the fragmentation of the society. And this is what I mean. This is why I designed another solution. Let's have emirates in the cities of Judea, the Arab cities of Judea and Samaria, in addition to the state which was already established by Hamas in Gaza, and we can, we, we, look, we learn how to live with hostile countries near us. We lived in, with Egypt, we lived with Jordan, we lived along with Syria and Lebanon. We know how to live, uh, uh, you know, with uh, hostile uh, um, neighbors. We know how to deal with them if needed, okay? But if we want real peace, we have to establish emirates and emirate in the Arab part of Hebron for the clans of Hebron. Another one in Jericho for the Arikat clan of Jericho. Another one in Ramallah for the Bagutis. Another one in Shechem, in, in Nablus, for the Masri, Tukan, and Shaka who live together very nicely. Another one in Kalkilia. Another one in Tulkaren. And another one in Jenin. While Israel should forever remain in the rural areas, which are 88% of the, of the area, and offering... A, a, a citizenship to the to the villagers, which are more or less uh, 14, 15 percent of the population. It is uh, it's the best deal which Israel can do, keeping the large part of the country, of the rural areas, with a minimal number of people who might be hostile. With the time, I hope that the that they will be accepted, like the Arabs in the Galilee. And in the south, they are, they are not Zionists, they are, they are not loving us. But if life might be better uh, with Israeli uh, uh, citizenship, they, in most cases, they will take it. So, this is what the, the only thing which is connected to, to sociology. This is the only solution. Unfortunately, Israeli leaders will not spend the 15 minutes to understand this idea. Those who did understand it and support it. Yet, now you have to convince the White House. 
to right. change its mind totally from two state solution to eight state or eight emirate solution actually to emulate or to copy the paradigm of the Gulf here to the to our area this is the only thing which works and is the only thing which has prospects to succeed thank you and we'll keep that uh, model in mind I want to I know we're running out of time I want to extend the time by the way somebody here I saw asking what is this flag uh, behind okay. me yeah, go ahead uh, uh, this is the flag of the Ahwaz the Arab region of Iran who are fighting for freedom you know to depart from Iran uh, just like the Azer Azerbaijanis the Kurds the Turkmen's and the Baluchis who want to divide Iran to ethnic states just like what happened with the Soviet Union with Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia they want the same thing in order to be independent and sovereign on their soil and to be released from the yoke of the Persians in Iran so I support them and this is why I have the flag thank you I know that Hugh would like to an opportunity to ask you a question so I'm going to defer to him right now okay thanks so much Mordecai um I'm, I'm just going to um refer to what's going on now with the Abraham Accords and the desire to bring Saudi Arabia into this with what you've just been talking about and the Emirates now if, if I can just say we we know that the Saudis don't like the Palestinians very much yet they seem to be insisting on a two-state solution what obstacle do you think that Saudi Arabia would present in achieving what you've just been talking about with the Arab Emirates? Well, I also thought like this: that the the, the Saudis uh, aiming are aiming at uh, uh, creating a Palestinian state, which, uh, in my view, will turn into Hamas, uh, another Hamas state in a very short while. However. Listening to uh, Muhammad, ben Sal Muhammad ben Salman, who spoke yesterday to Fox News, very long interview, almost half an hour, he always talked about making the Palestinians' life better. He didn't talk about the Palestinian state. He talked about making life better. By the way, he, he talked about uh, making life better in many places, not only for the Palestinians. Apparently, this is what this man, this is how he thinks. If, if he, he thinks that if life are better, if life, if life is better, people might push aside all kinds of desires to eradicate each other. Uh, this apparently, what this is what I understand from uh, from what he said, what he was saying, and I highly recommend to everyone to listen very carefully. He speaks excellent English. I think his English is better than mine, and. Uh, and, and 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 to listen very carefully to the nuances which Muhammad ben Salman are speaking about. He didn't speak about the Palestinian state. He talked about making life better. And making life better is something which Israel uh, might uh, agree within the framework of the Oslo agreements. Okay, we can, you know, some economic uh, uh, advantages or accepting uh, 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 money which Saudi Arabia might give to the Palestinians no yes there are a lot of things which uh, might give the Palestinians the feeling that they um you know the life is better yet Israel should forever uh, insist on uh, uh, preventing an establishing of a Palestinian state which by the way can can have a mutual defense treaty with Iran what are we going to do in such a case if a Palestinian sovereign state uh, will have a treaty with Iran when if you establish a clan state the clan always look for better life so maybe uh, if the government of Israel will send me to convince Muhammad ben Salman and I can do it in Arabic as well not only in English uh, to, that the Emirate solution is actually to emulate the Saudi structure to the Palestinian Authority or 
to turn the authority, the Palestinian authority, into maybe an umbrella, federation of Emirates. It's okay with me, as long as they don't have territorial contiguity. Uh, it's okay with me if they make some kind of a federation. Just like, by the way, the, the Gulf Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, is a federation of seven sovereign uh, Emirates. Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Ras al Khaimah, Fujairah, all these seven Emirates, which are united in the United Arab Emirates, UAE, are more like the European Union than Canada or the United States of America. Because each and every one of them is sovereign, unlike Ontario and Quebec, or Florida and Oklahoma. Okay? Florida, Oklahoma, Ontario, Quebec are not sovereign. Sovereignty belongs to the Union, both in Canada and in the United States. There, in the United Arab Emirates, each and every one is sovereign. Okay, they united the things like the currency and some things like, like Europe, and in Europe this as well. The European Union is a, European, is a union of sovereign states. Each and every one has its own army, uh, police, and all the signs of sovereignty. They didn't give up on sovereignty in Europe. So the Gulf Emirates are more or less uh, the same paradigm. And this is what I want to, um, to copy to this uh, area. And it works. It doesn't seem that the United States will support that. It looks very much like Biden is the two-state uh, champion these days. You know what, Andrea? Let's assume that Hebron, for example, or Jericho, uh, the minute which, which um, Abu Mazen leaves the arena in a way or another, they declare statehood. They announce that they are a state. They don't want to be part with, with Nablus or with others. They want to be a separate state. So will the United States uh, support it or not? Maybe not in the first, first minute, but when they understand that this is something which can work just like the Emirates in the Gulf, maybe they will take it because at the end of the day, you want something which works. You don't want something which doesn't work. So if they understand that this is the only thing which can work. Uh, most probably they will, um, they will uh, agree to this, especially if somebody explains to them. So I'm assuming, um, this will be the last question, that you are actively trying to initiate these conversations with the current Israeli government, but it is mired in other internal issues right now. So is anybody listening? Those who understand the culture of the Middle East want to listen and actually bought this idea. And since it's public, I can say that uh, even one minister, Nir Barkat, mm -hmm. is wholeheartedly adopted this idea and he tries to push it as much as he can. Yet, uh, apparently the White House is more powerful than Nir Barkat. Uh, and there are more people who know about this. And um, I know that behind the scenes, uh, especially when it comes to people who work on the, you know, on the field, they understand that if things go bad with the PA, Israel will have to delegate the authority to local uh, powers like families in local places, like in Hebron, in other places. Okay, thank you very much for this. Thank you for your fa fabulous presentation and Hugh for your fantastic um, series, the whole of whose land should be viewed by everybody that has joined us today. And I see the link was shared. So I would encourage everyone to do several things. Watch the series, share the episodes with everyone you know, ask other organizations to broadcast it, to send it out virally, to hold a seminar. You'll all receive um, a copy of the recorded recording from today's webinar, which you're also welcome to share. I'm quite sure that uh, Dr. Kadar would be thrilled to have you share his presentation. And so I'm going to really seriously encourage that you do that. I'd like to wish everybody a good Yontef, Shana Tova, Mutuka. Please take care, have an easy fast, and we'll meet again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.